we do a big class on care partners and people that have Parkinson's that are newly diagnosed. And one of the big points I want people to recognize is that as care partners, we, we have a tendency to want to jump in real quick. Um, and sometimes the person that has Parkinson's wants that help. And there's other times that they might not want that help. The true fact of the matter is, is that the more that we allow them to do for themselves, the more they're going to be able to do moving forward with the disease process. So we don't want to take away their ability, right? Good. You'll see on that big slide there, there's a lot of different things that people are doing. And I thought it was a good representation, even though it's kind of condensed. Um, activities of daily living include everything. Like it said, dressing, bathing. Um, those are what we call the basic activities of daily living, dress, uh, toileting, shaving your face, um, feeding yourself. All of those uh, are basic activities of daily living. And then we have instrumental activities of daily living, which is cleaning the household, um, paying bills, managing your medications. Those are a little bit more intense ones as we like to think of them. So again, our major focus is on maintaining your independence with those things. All right, so we're going to go right into, we're going to jump into your activities of daily living and some of the common problems that we see. Feeding. So some of the challenges with feeding are difficulty managing the utensils. What do I mean by that? Um, actually holding on to it, right? Churning it to bring it to your mouth, that's a problem. Um, you might find that when you're trying to feed yourself, you kind of stop short, and then we start coming forward to the food. That's a problem as well. Um, they were mentioning in the last session that your awareness of that is decreased a little bit. So you might think that you're bringing it to your mouth, and then you have that realization that you've come up short. All right, so then what we do is, again, we come forward, or our care partner might say that you need to scoot forward a little bit more, right? Um, so that's part of it. It's the proprioceptive nature or the perceptual nature of the disease is to come up short a little bit, undershoot, all right? So that's one strategy we can work on with feeding in occupational therapy is to teach you to bring the hand to the mouth, right? To bring the utensil all the way to the mouth, to go through that full range of motion, if you will, okay? So that's one component. The second component of feeding is that, like I already mentioned, is that you can't manage the utensil. You don't get a good grip on it. Okay? So there's a couple of different ways of looking at that. We can try and actually hold the utensil a little bit better. I like using visual feedback. And what that means is looking at it to see how you're actually holding on to it. Okay? Because we can change that. A lot of people will go right into built up utensils. They have big handles, and that's what we have on the slide. Let's see where it is, right there. So you'll see that those spoons, forks, and knives, they have big, big black handles on them. Okay, so that's one way. If you're having difficulty with your fine motor coordination or your ability to close your hand all the way, you can use bigger handled utensils. All right, and for some people that works very good. The other thing that you can do with a lot of those utensils is bend them. Okay, so you can kind of churn the spoon so that if you scoop the food and bring it to your mouth, and you can't turn it to get it in, we can bend it in a way that when you bring it up, it goes into your mouth. So that's one adaptation that you can do as well with your utensils. Um, a fork and a spoon, of course, would be most ideal for that. P posture is pretty important with feeding yourself. Um, some people might struggle with kind of slouching in the chair a little bit. So we need to really kind of make sure that you're set up for success. And by that, I mean that you're sitting tall, chest out, Good, maybe some lumbar support, not leaning off to one side. So we have to try and increase your awareness of that. We can act on that therapeutically by trying to actually show your body what it feels like to be in the proper position. Um, we can, I, I'm not a big fan of like wedging you in with pillows and doing all of these things to kind of hold you up in place because I feel like you might just lean into them a little bit more. All right, so you kind of rely on the pillows and supports to hold you up versus actively holding yourself up nice and tall. So posture is something that we want to consider as well. Here's my picture of that, which is, again, kind of skewed there a little bit. But you can see desirable versus undesirable posture. You do want to sit up nice and tall, uh, which is important, too, in helping with swallowing as well, right? Because that's a big part of eating, a, a safe part of eating, too, is making sure that you're not coughing during your eating. And sometimes we see that with the advanced Parkinson's is that you might have some coughing spells just because of difficulties with swallowing. All right. If that's the case, you want to make sure that you talk to your doctor about that and see about maybe having a speech therapy consult okay, to make sure that you're not 
aspirating, which is uh, very important. And again, I think one of the big factors that we can help correct that with is posture. All right. A couple of other things that we're going to move on from feeding. There's a scoop dish in the middle. And then you'll see on the far right for you guys, there's a, a plate guard. For those that are chasing your food along the plate and having difficulty poking it or scooping it up on the, the spoon, the plate guard or the rounded lip bowl will help bring it up to your spoon or uh, a fork. All right, so if you're having difficulty with that, those are some adaptations that might help a little bit. Okay. For the visual feedback that I was talking about, sometimes I'll have people feed themselves in front of a mirror. Um, it's hard for caregivers to always say, oh, you're doing this wrong. You got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this. The person with Parkinson's might find themselves to be a little bit frustrated with that because they get kind of tired of hearing about what they're doing wrong. Um, so I like to put the accountability on the person with Parkinson's and we'll sit in front of the mirror so they can see some visual feedback of what they're actually doing. And again, by that I mean when they stab the food, if they come up short, they say, oh, you know what, I'm not all the way to my mouth. I need to bring it a little bit closer to my mouth to be able to eat. Um, so that's a really nice strategy to help on it. We already talked about focusing on posture, and one great activity and task that you can do to help yourself is make sure you're doing some fine motor coordination and hand strengthening exercises in general to maintain the dexterity to be able to manipulate utensils. Um, as an occupational therapist, hands are part of our scope of practice, making sure that we're doing all of those exercises. And I have to say, I believe the hands are kind of overlooked a little bit. It's, it's, they're not the funnest exercises in the world, just sitting there going through hand strengthening and range of motion exercises. We can try and make them a little bit more engaging, but it's often overlooked. One, one thing in regard to hands is that and you, those that have Parkinson's might realize how important it is, is because we have to have the ability for fine motor for buttons, for zippers, for um, our pants, our buckles, things like that, because that's, that's pretty important as we get a little bit older, because that's, I always say that's one of the big guys' cruel jokes on us, is that as we get older, we have to go to the bathroom quicker. Uh, and sometimes with Parkinson's, it's hard to get up and get there in time as it is. And then when you get there, you're like, oh my goodness, now I have to manage my buttons and zippers and all these wonderful things. So it's really critical to practice your fine motor coordination exercises. You'll appreciate it later in life. So dressing, as we were just talking about, on top you'll see a picture of, that's a, a, button, uh, a button aid or a button hook. So if you're really struggling with buttons, it kind of slides through the button hole and it grabs the button and it pulls it through. They're pretty handy, um, especially if you're struggling with fine motor coordination and you're dressing up to go out somewhere nice and you want to get your button-up shirt on by yourself. It's, it's pretty good. It's a functional tool to use to help maintain the uh, ability to do that. Wear shirts that fasten in the front. Pullovers can be a little bit challenging. Um, through, the, through the process of Parkinson's, we, we might lose some of the range of motion in our shoulders, or we might be rounded a little bit, and it's kind of hard to get the shirt up and over your head and on your shoulders in general. So if you can get it on your arm and scoop it around and grab it and put your shirt on, that works out pretty well. But you might say, well, Brian, then I struggle with the buttons, and it's frustrating. Um, you can go with and I hate to say go with looser fitting shirts, but sometimes those work out pretty well too, to wear it just a touch bigger. Um, and again, when it comes down to dressing, I think it's really super important to make sure that you're practicing your exercises with your shoulder to maintain that range. You have to be able to reach behind um, to grab your shirt, put your coat on. A coat is a source of frustration for people as well. So we wanna do shoulder range of motion exercises to maintain the ability to do that. Lower extremity, pants, underwear, Socks, shoes, this is kind of where things get a little bit dicey. Um, there's a couple of ways that we can make it a little bit easier. Depending on the circumstances, some people like wearing more elastic based pants where you can just kind of pull them up and pull them down. That works out really well with incontinence and difficulty getting to the bathroom in time. So you don't have to manage the buttons, you don't have to manage the zipper, you can just pull them down and pull them up. That's a nice quick solution. Some people might say, well I like to do my pants still, Brian, because I'm a professional. And I, I get that. And my advice to you is that we can do, you can do custom Velcro closures. That might be nice too. Um, so just instead of having a button that you have to work through a hole or a snap, you can do just like a, a Velcro closure, which works out pretty well. Shoes. Um, the one thing that I really like the most is locking laces. Um, it's just a slide lace. It's, it's a tennis shoe lace, okay? And then at the top, it just has a little sliding mechanism that you kind of pull it, slide it up, and you're good to go. 
when you want to um, release it to put it on, you just slide it down. The shoe you can open up, and that's it. Very easy. You don't have to. You don't have to try and tie them up. All right. Other solutions for shoes, of course, would be getting. Uh, I think we're past the point of uh, some vel Velcro closure is an option, but we have a lot of nice uh, other options as well, including some. They're more elastic based, where the tongue is kind of tied to the shoe with elastic. Those work out pretty nice as well. Couple things that I put up here for pictures. There's something called the foot funnel. It's a pretty handy little device that you can kind of put on the back of the shoe so that it doesn't collapse down on you when you're trying to push your foot into it. It works out pretty well. You might use that instead of a long handled shoehorn, um, but you can probably use either of them if you'd like. The miracle dressing aid. Um, the reason why I put that up is because a lot of the people that I'm seeing uh, at home in the later stages of Parkinson's, they really struggle getting their pants on and off. And I wanted to keep this very real world, and I don't want to scare anybody, but the fact of the matter is, is when somebody's living at home by themselves, they have to be able to do these things, and I have to be able to offer them solutions to do it. Briefs. Pulling a brief on is tough, okay? So th the reason why is because it's elastic and it kind of closes up on itself, right? That's the whole purpose, is that it has to kind of be relatively tight around our hips and our legs to, maintain, to serve its purpose. So to hold that open, and get down far enough over your foot, it's very challenging for people. That miracle dressing aid, you can look at a video on YouTube. I didn't attach it to this, but you can put your pants over it and your brief and lower it down, and it holds it open, and you can just slide your feet in and pull it up. It looks a little bulky, but I have to say it's a pretty good tool to make sure that you can do your dressing on your own. If you have to change a brief, like I already mentioned, um, there's a lot of frustration that comes along with that in the later stages. I don't want to completely focus on the late stage, but like we talked about, if you have to change a brief, unfortunately, you have to take your pants off to do that, correct? So then they have to spend all that time and energy getting their pants off their foot, using their, their dressing stick to push their pants off, and then they take the brief off, and they're leaning forward, and they're exhausted. Um, a potential solution to manage that with the brief, if you're conscious and you're doing pretty well with your bladder, is that you can use a pad inside the brief. That's a pretty quick fix, where you just use a pad to save yourself, and then you don't have to change the brief every time as long as you're not completely soiling the brief, all right? Uh, again, I, I, don't, I don't think this is the greatest subject in the world, but it's a very real world thing that I deal with in the home a lot. And I really like to focus on giving people strategies to maintain this, their dignity in this regard. So using a brief is a great, I mean, excuse me, using a brief and a pad in the brief. Pull the pad out. And the benefit of pulling, using the pad is that when you pull down your pants, of course, in your brief, you can just take the pad out. You don't have to take everything off. And it's a very, it's a very quick time saver. Um, and it's really beneficial. And it saves a lot of energy. So onward to toileting. I put a couple of products up here. For those that are, um, for loved ones that are dealing with people that have incontinence, it's very frustrating. OK? And the reason why is because I've heard this complaint a lot. They say, Brian, you know, he doesn't go to the bathroom all day long. He'll go maybe twice. And then when I put him to bed, he has to get up every hour. And I've had 80-year-old caregivers look at me in, in a very fatigued way and say, I, I, don't, I don't know how much longer I can do that because I have to go in, help him out of bed, take him into the bathroom, sit him down, change his brief, and let's go and do it again. And then I put him back to bed, and then an hour later, we're doing it again. So my solution to that is that depending on where they're at in the disease progression, and I, I don't want you to think that I'm telling everybody to wear a brief all night long. That's not my solution. I offered her a different solution. We had a handrail put next to his bed. He could get out of the bed, stand up, and we could place the urinal and have him go to the bathroom and do it in about three minutes, which is, it, it's, for me, it was a time saver. And it was really important because three minutes versus 20 minutes is a big deal when it comes to sleep. So we offered that solution. She was working at 80 years old, or is working at 80 years old, and also still said, this is too much, Brian. I need to come up with a solution. And she wanted him to stay in bed and use a brief overnight have a caregiver come in in the morning and help him clean up, OK? So we had problems with briefs because some of the briefs leak, all right? I did a lot of research on that through the incontinence uh, organization. And some of the briefs, there's, there are really spectacular briefs out there. The Abena, um, I don't know if I put how many it can hold. I think I put that it can hold, if you will. Give me two seconds. It's 64 to 81 ounces of output fluid. That's a lot, OK? That's a lot of um, fluid that it can handle. A Depends, for instance, I believe they said that they can hold 16 ounces. It's a huge difference. 
And there's a great source of pride that can come along in that, in a sense, because as my grandpa was going through the, the end stage of his life, he still wanted to go to church. And he became very embarrassed because his briefs would leak. And I said, Grandpa, I have a solution for that. We have a different brief that we can use. Grandpa, of course, being a World War II vet and 91 years old at that point, said, well, geez, Brian, those are pretty expensive. So I did a little cost analysis for Grandpa, and I said, Grandpa, you have to use that, depends, and you're putting like all these different pads in there. And I said, that actually costs more than the $1.36 per brief that you can get from the Abina. And he switched. It was funny because I came back next time. I said, well, Grandpa, like, do you want me to order them? And he didn't say anything. And I came back next time, and he said, Brian, did you order those briefs? Um, and I hadn't ordered them yet, but I said, Grandpa, I'm going to take care of it right now. And to me, that was a big deal because he was still able to go to church. He wasn't worried about having accidents and leaking through. Um, and it gave him a, lot, a, a great sense of pride at the end of his life. Um, so that's really important. And I think it's critical for everybody because I don't want you to shut yourself in based on the fact or worry about being incontinent. So we want to give you options. All right. The other thing that's in the picture is there are covers that you can order. Okay. So you, you wear the brief, and if you're going out to a public event, you can wear a cover over it so that it doesn't leak through. And they're not like the old plastic style that make a lot of noise. Okay, so they're very flexible and they're breathable too, which is kind of nice too because you don't want to feel spectacularly hot. All right, so that's the Gary wear. That's in the middle. And then the other fancy thing that somebody taught me about, I get to learn every day too, is that when they're on trips, sometimes it's hard because if a caregiver is taking their loved one on a trip, there's not really the option to walk into the bathroom with them and help them. Right? I mean, you can't, I think there's becoming more options in regard to family restrooms, which is a nice kind of option for people, but it's a little bit uncomfortable to say, well, I got to walk in there and help them out. So then people avoid trips. And like I said, I want to keep people active going and participating in life. So they have these uh, travel johns, and that's in the yellow there. That's a small disposable, uh, like I said, this is, you know, I might just step down if that's all right. That's the disposable urinal right there on the side. It, it's very small, it closes. Um, you can use it with some help, and then you just kind of roll it up and throw it out. All right, so that's a really nice option, too. Going on to modifications, that's some other component of occupational therapy is that we can make modifications in the home because we want to keep you there. That's my big goal in home care. If I don't keep people at home, I don't really have work, right? That's my, my job. Um, so necessary bathroom modifications. Real quick, and I'm going to pound through these a little bit faster. Grab bars. I think grab bars are really important. Um, Angled grab bars work pretty good on the side of the toilet. All right, and there's a picture of that, and I'll show you real quick. I like that it's angled because when you go to sit down, you can hold the horizontal, and when you're in sitting, you can grab the angle to pull yourself up into standing. Okay, that's, that's pretty important because people with Parkinson's do a lot better of a job pulling themselves up into standing versus pushing up into standing because sometimes as we're coming up, we fall backwards a little bit. So always having something in front makes it so much easier. All right, so that's the one thing that I like. Grab bars in the showers. It's a necessity. Suction cup grab bars give me a lot of gray hair. Um, I, I would encourage you to not use those. I understand the benefit of having to not drill into your tile, and I've done a lot of calling around to have grab bars installed for my people, and it costs $150 generally for two grab bars to be installed, and I think it's a very valuable um, something to have in the bathroom because that's where a lot of people fall, okay? Or they start avoiding the showers, which isn't good either. All right, you can do sponge, yeah. Macomb County will do it for free or for net cost. That's right. There is, yes, so some of the counties, depending on where you're at, they have services available for seniors, uh, safety programs. I, it just takes a little bit longer. You have to get on a list and then it is low, uh, low cost or no cost. So that's a spectacular option as well, thank you. Um, toilet rails, those are uh, on the toilet. Right there, a second one, where you can use those to help lower yourself down or push yourself up into standing. A second option of the toilet rail is one that's connected to the toilet. Sometimes I like that a little bit more because it doesn't have the legs to trip over on the ground. Sometimes you can kick those little toilet rails and that can be a little bit cumbersome. The last option that some people like to use is putting the bedside commode over the toilet, um, which works out pretty good too because you still have the arms to get up and down from and we can adjust the height of the toilet. All right. It does have a splash guard as well, which is important because that can be a little bit complicated for the gentlemen that are using bedside commodes over the toilet. Okay. Couple other options. The toilet vader, that's the first one there. And if you look down at the bottom, it has a base which they actually install to raise your toilet up. So if you're a big fan of using your toilet, um, but you just need it to be a little bit higher, 
that's a nice option. One of my gentlemen that I've worked with for years had one of those put on, and it worked out very well for him. Okay, So they're not horribly expensive. Hinged toilet seats. I like everything that you're going to use for the toilet and the bathroom to be attached. I don't want one that sits on top of it, because if you hit it funny, it goes tumbling over. All right, So I prefer that they're attached to the toilet. The hinged one is nice because you can lift it up and clean under it too. Okay, And then the bathroom in the shower, you'll see grab bars, one to get in, right here, stepping into the shower, and then you have one as you're coming across. Um, I finally made the conscious decision to go over to my parents' house and say, well, geez, you know, I lecture everybody all day long about having grab bars, and I haven't taken care of my parents yet. My mom being 70, my dad being 80, and both of them have had falls, and I said, that's kind of an occupational therapist, am I? I haven't taken care of my parents, so I went over and put some grab bars in their shower. Um, they're a great thing to have, yes. Yeah. Yep. So I would do wherever you enter the shower, whether it's a, a door closure system or a shower curtain, I would say I always like having a vertical one to hold on to step up over whatever threshold that you're stepping into. And I like one on the inside wall that, that is angled. The reason why I like it angled is because if you're sitting on a chair, you can use it to help kind of pull you up. And once you're up, because we all have to kind of stand up to rinse off, it's really good to have something to hold on to. A lot of us will lose our balance when we close our eyes. If you close your eyes, you'll start doing this whole little thing. And you have to keep in mind when you're showering, of course, you're going to close your eyes momentarily to rinse your hair from the soap. That's why I like that one, because you can be held at variable spots. Okay. And also, it's a good idea, thinking forward, of saying if you're sitting on a chair, you can use it at different levels. So that's why it's nice. Horizontal ones on the inside, it's hard because you have to, again, push up into standing. And we don't have that forward trunk flexion, if you will, or leaning forward ability to be able to do that. So, and then, again, I'm very cost conscious. Um, I have four children. I'm, I'm financially conservative, as I like to say. Some would say cheap. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is the benefit of being, um, I wouldn't ask my patients to do anything extraordinary that I probably wouldn't pay for myself. This one I, I saw recently is Senior Safety Pro. If you'll notice, their bathtub is still in there. Okay? These are all from the original bathtubs. This is, this is a bathtub that was cut, and they leave a small lip on the bottom, put the grab bars in, and then you have the seat. And this one has, um, I believe, a, I don't know what kind of door closure. I don't know if it pulls open or whatever it may be. It's tough to see on this one. Or it slides back. Actually, I think it slides back along the track. It's a great option. Some of these options are... Um, on Senior Safety Pro, they have a website. The budget one, I think the last one is the budget one, and that's $1,400. Um, and then the first one uh, is probably $3,200. You might say, well, geez, $3,200 is still a lot. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's a really great option. And gutting your bathroom is a lot more expensive than $3,000, I assure you. Okay, especially when you get into specialty bathtubs and things like that. Okay, so these are really nice options. You don't have to change your tile if you like your tile. Um, and it's, again, very cost effective. Bed mobility, a couple of things I like for the bed is to make sure that you have a, um, a bed cane or a handle on the bed. It's very critical. That's the bed cane that I'm talking about. Some people will use security poles. I don't know if you've seen those yet. They're pressure fit from the floor to the ceiling. Again, these are spectacular because people can use them to pull themselves up into sitting, or, excuse me, standing. Um, can use it for a sitting too in the bed if you want to reach over and kind of bring yourself out of the bed. Anytime you're going to consider a, a device to help you up into standing, having it out in front of you is way easier okay, than, than pushing from a handle on a chair. Sometimes you'll see the lift chairs even have handles on them to help push up into standing. But if we can get something out in front, it makes it way easier to stand up. The bed cane is very handy. Bed mobility is one of the biggest challenges with Parkinson's, getting in and out of the bed. I always say with my people that have Parkinson's, they always they lay where they they lay where they land. Wherever they get into the bed, I see people kind of hugging the corner because they don't have that flexibility to be able to roll onto their back or roll onto their left side or roll back onto the right. It doesn't come very easy. And then if I cover cover you with sheets and blankets, it gets much more complicated as well. All right. So I think a bed cane is very handy. We practice bed mobility a lot and some strengthening with that too. The last thing uh, in regard to bed mobility is make sure that you have um, that you select the appropriate mattress. Don't get a Tempur-Pedic. Um, I would discourage that. I've seen a lot of my people that have Tempur-Pedic. You kind of sink into it, and you can't get firm footing to be able to roll or reposition in bed. So that might not be the best option for you. I would strongly encourage you, if you're going to get a new mattress, go to the store and check it out. 
If you want to get an adjustable bed, those are nice too. Um, but just make sure it's not too soft. A lift chair, stair lift, and a portable wheelchair ramp. My goal, again, is to keep people at home, keep you um, from having to go to assisted living facilities, which get quite, uh, quite costly. Our, the, my, my purpose, if you think about aging in place, is to modify your home to be able to st safely stay there. So again, a small investment in the beginning is worthwhile in making sure that you're safe at home um, and you can maintain your independence, which again is invaluable. The lift chair I like, the stair lift. Sometimes when we bought our houses when we were in our 40s, we didn't really think about what it was going to look like when we were in our 80s or 70s, and we have a colonial, and it gets challenging to get upstairs. A stair lift will give you that independence and ability to do that. Portable wheelchair, wheelchair ramp is nice as well to be able to get into and out of the house. Okay, that's my section. I'm going to jump out for a minute. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Glenna Yarrow, and I'm a physical therapist as well. You've seen a lot of physical therapists and occupational therapists today, right? I want to talk a little bit about fall prevention and home safety because they really go hand in hand, okay? So when we think about falls, let's talk about the causes then what are the effects of the fall, and then most importantly, some prevention tips. Because I want you to be able to walk away today from the things that Brian and I presented with some helpful, useful tips, right? Knowledge is powerful, and it's great to get lots of education, but it's also really great when you can go, go home from a presentation and say, you know what, here's the top five things I'm gonna implement, or I'm gonna purchase, or I'm gonna go do. Brian brought some great ideas up. There's a little overlap between a few things Brian and I said, so I'll be able to buzz through here quickly when I get to that. So let's talk about the causes of falls first. Vision is a big one, right? We know with Parkinson's, there can be visual impact, right? There can be blurring vision, there can be excessive tearing, there can be dry eyes. When your vision's impacted, then your depth perception gets impacted. So suddenly, you're not seeing a step, or you might see a step, and you might not gauge exactly the height of that step. So vision is a problem. Muscle weakness, we know that's a huge problem when we're ambulating, and that causes falls. Postural instability, you've heard a lot about that today, and the inability to firmly plant your feet, right? That's gonna cause a fall. One of the things I think people don't think about a lot of times is loss of confidence or second guessing your movements. After a fall, you lose that confidence, right? And confidence is powerful. If you think about everything in life, from an interview, or you think about basketball players standing at the free throw line, and suddenly it gets in their head, they lose confidence, right? And they're amazing players, and they can't throw the ball from the free throw line because it gets in their head. When you start to lose confidence and you start to second guess yourself, it doesn't matter what you're doing in life, it becomes very problematic, and that will create falls. Just difficulty thinking and fear, that fear of falling, that confidence issue. How about medications? Can you name a medication you take that when you flip around and it looks, what are the issues it might cause dizziness? Is that like on every prescription bottle you've ever had? Well, average patient has eight to 10 pills. If eight to 10 pills all cause dizziness, what are the odds you're gonna have some dizziness and fall, right? Difficulty balancing from the rigidity in the inability to respond to a fall is one of the biggest issues because of that loss of the rapid counter movement. When you start to feel a fall coming on, it's that inability to take that giant step to counter the fall. So that can be a cause. And then just difficulty walking in the freezing of the gait. What are the effects of falls? Well, we know main reason for hospitalization in Parkinson's patients is from falling. We know that falls can cause wheelchair confinement, and that's the last thing we want, right? We want to keep moving. You've heard that all day today. There's a higher need for healthcare services after a fall, right, from an injury. If it's a minor fall, maybe it's just bruising, and maybe it's just some confidence issues again or quality of life. If it's a severe fall, it could be a fracture. The number one fracture in a Parkinson patient fall is the hip and the femur. And the other most common fractures are ribs, clavicle, and the arm. And fractures lead to periods of immobility, right? We don't want that. That leads to depression. It leads to constipation and weakness. And again, more loss of confidence. And then, of course, insomnia. So those are all the effects from falls. And we know severe falls, that can be worse. That can lead to brain injuries, concussions, seizures, and even death. So 
most importantly, causes and effects. But what you're really here today to hear about is, okay, let's not fall. Let's just not fall. Tell me what to do not to fall, okay? So let's talk a little bit about some tips. All day you've heard about physical therapy and exercise. It's been great listening to the different speakers because it's almost like one feeds into the next, into the next. So you've heard so much about exercise and physical therapy. Uh, having a background in physical therapy, being a PT for 20 years, I, I'll just give you a little insight. I'm not going to talk in depth about this at all because that's not today's talk. But just to give you an idea of folks that go for physical therapy in a clinic, perhaps in some of the earlier stages of Parkinson's where they're working on, on prevention tips for falls, what will they do? You might say, what do they do there? Well, they might put you on a treadmill in a harness, okay? And they're gonna have you walk at a higher speed and they're gonna have you walk in different directions, forward walking, backward walking, sidestepping to the right, sidestepping to the left, and maybe a little fancy footwork called braiding on a moving target, on a treadmill. Thank God for the harness, right? So that's one example of what they might do in advanced physical therapy. Step training, they'll turn that tr treadmill on and off quickly, right? Because it stops, you have to be able to do that counterbalance, that wide base of support step to react to a fall. Functional balance training is when they'll put you on an unstable surface, like a balance board, and they might challenge you cognitively and throw a ball at the same time while you're trying to do balance. And then as we talked about movement strategies, how to start to feel a fall, how to quickly widen the base of support and counteract that fall. Those are some of the different things they'll do in physical therapy. This is maybe the best slide of the day, of the moment in this presentation in terms of give me my golden nuggets to go home with today. What can I do to help myself? We're gonna talk very briefly about a home safety evaluation with the next handful of slides. It's in your PowerPoint. And I know we're running a little bit late, so I don't want to go in great detail about that, but you're going to be able to go room to room in your home and make sure you've got all these angles covered. And it's not just Parkinson's. This is general home safety for any age, for any diagnosis. Make your, safe, your home safe. We know proper lighting in the stairways and entrances. Motion sensors are great. They make light, motion sensor night lights. You can buy right at Home Depot. Plug them in in all your different rooms. You get up at night. As soon as it senses motion, the light goes on in the bedroom. Walk to the bathroom, walk through the hallway, the light goes on. When you leave, the light goes off. They're just wonderful devices. Of course, non-skid surfaces, right? If you've got slippery floors, you've got to think about that. Um, your rigid medication schedule, you've got to stay very regulated with the medication schedule, right? Because we know if we deviate from that with Parkinson's. It creates big issues with falling. Appropriate footwear, Brian touched on that. There's so many opportunities for different footwear that are out there today. You want a good tying shoe, heels, not allowed. Clogs, not allowed. We've got to have that good solid shoe, right? Here's a real important trick. Never have both your hands occupied when you're walking because if you start to fall, you've got to have one hand to try and break the fall. Because if you don't break the fall, you break the hip. So walking with items in your hand is really borrowing trouble. We don't want to do that. And we want to avoid multitasking when we're walking if, you have a, if you're a fall risk. Studies have shown people just driving and listening to their cell phone on Bluetooth, it creates 40% distraction just listening and having a conversation on the phone to your driving and you're not even doing touching the phone at all, right? So the same thing is whether you're driving or whether you're walking, if you're doing another activity, even as simple as talking, it is distracting. And it's very important if you have frequent falls when you've chosen to get up and walk that you're very focused on that activity. Take your time if you stand up. We know there's blood pressure changes when we move rapidly from laying down to sitting to standing. So take your time when you have a shift in your position. You know, create a space you're comfortable with in your home and don't reorganize the furniture. The only time you should change furniture and move things around is if there's clutter and you have to make room for assistive equipment like a walker or wheelchair, then of course you might have to move a dresser, move a lazy boy, but this is not the time to redecorate the home because Familiarity is so important, especially if you get up at night, right? We're tired, cognitively we're not, you know, we're not there in the middle of the night. 
It's not the time to rearrange the bedroom where it normally is as it relates to the bathroom. And you always want to seek medical attention if you've had a fall. Let's just walk through the different rooms in the house kind of quickly here, talking about the bedroom, right? You're looking for throw rugs and torn carpet. You're looking for any kind of clutter in the room to take care of that. Do you have access to a telephone or a cell phone? Is it on the nightstand? And do you have your important phone numbers there on the nightstand? Of course, we talked about lighting. When we talk about the bed being too high or too low, that's as, as important for your caregiver even. If you have a caregiver, if a bed is too low, that's requiring your loved one to be bending way over to assist you getting out of the bed. And we don't want anybody hurting their back. So it's very important the bed height as well as how firm the bed surface is. And I think Brian talked a little bit about that. Watch out for tangled electrical cords, phone cords, oxygen tank cords, all of that. Is your furniture providing good support? We talked about the nightstand and emergency phone numbers. I'll give you a little, just a, a sidebar a hint. When we talk about bed mobility, flannel sheets are one of the most difficult things to work with. If you struggle with bed mobility, use silk sheets. Silk sheets allow you to move much easier in the bed. And again, as Brian mentioned, do not have those tight restricting um, blankets over the top of your feet and over you. You want loose, you want your blankets and things to be loose. Bathroom, great, great ideas on grab bars. Be careful of slippery floors, use bath mats. Be cautious if you have a large step in surface, if it's a tub or a shower. Look at transfer benches. They allow you to sit and then slide over the surface if it's a bathtub that you're working with and then lift your legs in. So when you're lifting your legs, you're not standing trying to lift a leg. You're sitting and you slide into the tub and then the legs come in. Those are called transfer benches. Correct height, of course, is important with the toilet seat. Another trick with toilet seats with vision issues. You don't want your toilet seat to be the same color as your floor. If your toilet seat is white, your toilet's white, the floor's tiles white, and you have visual issues as time goes on, it becomes very difficult for a man to stand in front of a toilet when everything is white and blurry. Use a contrast color. Use a different color toilet seat for that color contrast. Um, be careful of hot water. You know, are your medications stored properly and overhead cabinets being too high or too low, right? How about the living room? Again, clutter. Is, the furn is all the furniture you know, stable or unstable? Can you reach light switches? Is there adequate lighting? Is there a challenge to opening and closing windows? If you've got windows that stick and you're going to bend over to try and pull up on stuck windows, there's a good chance you could topple over. Throw rugs. If I had a nickel for 20 years in physical therapy for every throw rug that gets put at the top of a staircase, I don't know why, but we don't want throw rugs ever ever, ever near staircases. They just are really a bad idea in general if you're using a walker or a wheelchair. Um, if the floor is uneven, always look for room temperature as well. If there's a glare, consider blinds. And, you know, again, that big comfy chair is, is, can be problematic to get out of. Brian mentioned a lift chair. We saw them for years in physical therapy. And nowadays, they're so popular. You can get them at Sam's Club. You don't even have to get the medical ones. Um, you know, if you want to save some money on that front. And the kitchen, same kind of thing. Most important thing if you're laying out your kitchen is the things you touch every day should be at waist height. If, you know, don't put the things you use all day long in the highest cupboards or in the lowest cupboards. Those cupboards should always be safe for those things you use at Christmas time. You know, the crock pot or the blender you use once a year. But everything you use day to day should be at waist level conserves energy and it prevents you from bending over and falling. Um, spoiled food in the refrigerator, all general safety type techniques, okay? And the basement, basements are always worrisome, especially if you go down there alone. Um, watch for laundry detergent that gets spilled in front of the, the, the washing machine or the dryer, that we see that frequently. Um, and again, always watching your pathways to make sure that there's no clutter. And lastly, the yard and the garage. You know, be careful of power tools and lawn chemicals. Is everything secured and put away? Handrails, no cracked steps, no loose handrails. 
And I, I, think I would encourage people, if you're having difficulty getting up and, and answering your front door, and especially in the day and age in the world we live in today, you know, there's so many home camera devices available today. You see that ring on TV where the camera's in the doorbell and you can see who's at the front door. Why exert all of that energy to answer the front door and, you know, it's somebody selling you windows that you don't really need right now. So think about cameras and things that allow you to see who's standing on your porch. That's just good safety no matter who you are. And with that, I tried to move us along. I'm going to open it up for questions for both Brian and I today. I'm going to answer one question real quick, and then I'll get, I'll get the other one to you. Um, we were asking about um, Medicare reimbursement for hospital bed, beds in general, and then the, um, the lift chair. From, from my understanding, what it comes down to for the lift chair is they'll pay for a portion of the motor. Um, mm -hmm. Everything that I've seen in regard to lift chairs, I think that will what I would mention is that it's, it's most reasonable and by the time you they reimburse you for the motor, it's still about $1,000 out of pocket. So my, my uh, advice is to go to Art Van, mm -hmm. go to the, one of the, the stores like that and find a lift chair that fits you well. Because they, as soon as you buy a medical device, you buy a medical lift chair, the price is probably double than what you're gonna pay at Sam's Club or at Art Van. So even if Medicare pays the mechanism, the motor, the chair is still so much more. Yeah, so just keep that in mind. And then for the hospital bed, my tip on, ho uh, on beds for Medicare, if they deliver a hospital bed to you and you're having difficulty with the height of the bed, you might ask to pay the difference for the electric height adjust. So you can raise it up without having to get down and crank it up um, and, and lower it too, which can be really helpful for caregivers. So I would consider paying for that upgrade. And then the other thing is when they send a hospital bed out to you, they send it with the Crummiest mattress, um, I think about the old roll, uh, hide, uh, the roll away beds that you fold up and the mattress folds up. Yeah. That's kind of your mattress. You can ask them, all right, up to a year, you can ask them for a different mattress. And usually I'll call up the provider, whether it's, uh, I, I can't remember who the supplier is, either Benson's or Wright and Philippus. Only one of them has the account now for, to be a provider for hospital beds. And I always say, you know, my patient's really having difficulty repositioning. Can you send a firmer mattress? And they can. <laughs> they can. Yeah. They can. Slow? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so you can't. Yeah, yeah. After, right. after 13 months, you own it. Yeah, question. Or slow down. We have a question over here. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. Good point. Just another little tip in the bathroom too I, mean, I forgot to mention is it's very important to, use, to think about using soap on a rope or liquid soap. When you use a little hand bar of soap, it's so easy to drop. You don't want to be bending over in a shower. I've also seen patients put a bar of soap in an old nylon because it's easier to hold on to the nylon and then the soap doesn't slip out of your hands. And if you need something to attach it to, you can put a grab bar in. Grab bars. Love those grab bars. Hint, hint. PTOT, yes, <laughs> Is there any way one can learn how to fall safely? How to fall safely. <laughs> yes. When it comes to falling, it's about the counter motion. So the, you know, the most important thing is to have an arm free to try and break the fall. There's Drop kind of, the there, is a, there is a little kind of crumble tuck method. Um, you have to be careful as an occupational therapist. Instinctively, we, we want to protect our face and our head, of course. So our hands go out. Sometimes the reflexes with Parkinson's are a little bit slower. So it's always kind of a slow crumble or just kind of a going down. My advice to you in regard to how to fall, if you're falling frequently, you should have, I, I, in a perfect world, we'd have a caregiver or somebody to kind of supervise. Um, so use your gait belts if you're helping somebody that has really okay. affected balance. And I always kind of, if you don't mind if I step yes. in here, I always kind of stay close with my body because I'm only so big. So I use my hips too and then I can help lower somebody down to the ground if we have to. And we don't want to be holding on to clothing. I know people hate gait belts, but clothing is too loose. The only thing in all the years of physical therapy I did that I was even somewhat accepting of was a man's belt, but that was never a favorite thing too. Gait belts are the safest thing, but clothing's too loose, you're not gonna catch them. 
I will say there is a safer way to get up than there is even to fall. To Brian's point, what, try to protect the head. That's the most important thing. But getting up, helping someone get up, if you're in the home, try to bring a chair to them. Don't try to pick somebody up from a floor. You're going to hurt yourself. So bring a chair over to them. And if they're on the floor, if you can get them to their knees and their hands on the chair, and then using a gate belt or their belt, get one knee up, let them try to push off the chair and come up. It's easier to give techniques of getting up than it is to try and, and really fall safely. It's all about the head and the hip. Mm -hmm. That last explanation just uh, answered a bit of the question I had. But Brian, just a few minutes earlier, and I couldn't quite understand, but did, did you demonstrate if you have to fall, how to fall? Well, I was saying that a lot of, so if people are going forward, they kind of do like a, a slow crumble to the floor and then they just kind of go down and then that's it. I think it's important, like they were saying, so just kind of crumble forward. Uh, just bending down and kind of gently lower yourself down to the floor. That's what I would say. I think you can go forward your head, but you have to protect your, you have to kind of protect your head. That's what we have to do. We have a lot of people on blood thinners too. The only time that I've seen briefs covered are under Medicaid and then also um, when somebody's on hospice service. Okay. Now you said that you don't have about two to four ounces because four years ago they only had medical bandits and I ended up doing with my husband in Victor and Canada which has 2,000 cc which is a little bit more than the 64 ounces which was great and he's still on that. Yeah, yeah, that would be. Or the wooden it was. It definitely was the sun. I think the abena, it depends on the circumstances of what you're doing. One la that, that kind of triggered one last thought, and I know we're at the end. I have to remind people that with briefs, they have to be changed, and I hate to say it, like three times a day. And you're like, ooh, that's, that's a big cost. The reason why I say that is because people will get urinary tract infections. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna close with one last story is that I was helping a, a, an elderly 90 year old gentleman to the bathroom and I walked into his bathroom and he had a brief hanging over his, his garbage can. And I, I looked at it and I said, oh boy. I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm drying it out, Brian. I said, <laughs> oh. I said no, Yes. no, you cannot do that. Um, I saw someone yeah. put him in the oven. So I, I understand the cost component of it, and I'm very conscious of that, like I said, but it's super critical to change your brief because you're putting yourself at a significant risk for a urinary tract infection. You're going to get really sick. Urinary tract infections, we don't think are a big deal, but we're, when we're in our 80s and 90s, it can do quite a number on you. So that's another, all I have to say. Another technique is you could get the sweatpants with Velcro all the way down on both sides, and if you had to change a brief standing, you can rip both sides of the brief. You, know, you can open up the sweatpants with the Velcro, rip both sides of the brief, put one up, and then Velcro back. Okay. Uh, one more question is that um, I, we need some grab bars, those bent grab bars at our house. So where do I go about getting those yeah. and getting them installed? So, I mean, some of the medical supply places will do it, have people do it. Um, I, I work, I live in Gross Point Woods, and I um, lived in St. Clair Shores before that. We had an old style hardware place there called Gilbert's. Some of the older style hardware stores, I call them and they have a contractor list. And anybody that they put, generally put on their list are pretty trustworthy and I'll call them and get some pricing options in that regard. You can call a handyman or a handyman service as well, as long as I always like to say if they're licensed, that's probably pretty important too, because mm -hmm. they will be drilling into your tile. Um, but, but again, I s strongly encourage people to, that should be an, um, a must have for all people. And they do make aesthetically pleasing grab bars. Now Delta has a line where they have a soap dish that's meant to be a grab bar, and they have a towel bar that's meant to be a grab bar. So it has dual purpose. It actually uses, we can use it for a grab bar, but we can also use the, like we already used the towel bar for a grab bar, 
but you have to remember that those are mortared in and not anchored. Okay, so They're it's really studs. important. Yeah, and you can might try your area agency on aging, AAA, and ask for a referral of who they recommend to install. They might have a list. Good. Thank you Great. all. Thank you, Thank you very much.